Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Ramadan Mutahir. With me, your host, Sadat Muhammad, and of course, all my wonderful guests. But before I do introduce them, I'd just like to ask how have you been faring this Ramadan? I, re I do really hope that you've been observing your prayers, you've been saying the right prayers, you've been asking for what you need. Even though, of course, you would need to ask for the necessary, but then know what you need the most. Because as you grow, you develop, you experience a lot of things. So you usually would ask for things when you were a child. And then upon, grow upon growing up and developing, there are things you start seeing in your reality. Ask for ease, first, of, first and foremost. Seek for forgiveness and seek for more knowledge to understand why people act a certain way, how you can help people, how Allah can ease off your affairs and of course deal with the tests as well. MashaAllah and Alhamdulillah, I'm here with Sheikh Hassan. Barakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for Thank being you, here. Sir. And of course I have Mr. Kareem. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. And of course myself, Sadat Muhammad, once again, will be taking a quick break and as soon as we're back, we shall start off with the show. This is Ramadan Mutahir. Do stay tuned. Welcome back from the break. Do follow us on our social media platform to stay in touch with us and engage with us as much as possible. But without any further ado, let's get to know our guests real quickly. I'll start off with uh, Sheikh Hassan. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi wa ma wa ala ba'd. My name is Hassan Idris Tahir, the head and the chief imam of Abba Salam home. And Abba Salam home is one of the government approved of energies in Lagos State. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, we've been on for about 33 years so far. And may Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala reward all those, you know, uh, behind the, you know, the home. And may Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala in this blessed month of Ramadan put it in your skill on the day of resurrection. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Thank you. And uh, to Mr. Karim. Mm -hmm. All right. My name is Olaide Karim. I'm, an, I'm an educationist. I'm a travel agent. And I'm also a public affairs analyst. Alhamdulillah, has been Ramadan ever since. Alhamdulillah. So, it's good to be here again. It's good to be here again. And Alhamdulillah, it's good to have you here too, our dear audiences. Thank you so much for being here. Well, we shall be moving into our sermon session right about now with Sheikh Hassan. <laughs> Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala amma ba'd Viewers, assalamu alaikum Once again, uh, insha'Allah what we'll quickly remind ourselves on Is uh, regarding the Eid Eid al-Fitr is uh, one of uh, the celebrations We usually have at the end of one of the acts of ibadah and the act of ibadah, which that celebration follows, is uh, the fasting of the month of Ramadan. And as Muslims, whenever Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala give us any opportunity to do something good, we have to show appreciation to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, as said by Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, that well, in shakartum, He said, if you show appreciation to me, I will increase you in my blessing. وَلَيْنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ If you are grateful, my punishment is very, very, you know, my, my wrath or punishment is very, very severe. So we thank Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala for the opportunity of Ramadan. And uh, Eid uh, is uh, one of, uh, Eid al-Fitr is one of the two, you know, Eid we usually have in the month, you know, in the Muslim uh, uh, calendar. We have Eid al-Kabir, Eid al-Fitr. And uh, regarding Eid al-Fitr, it is a day that we show our procession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in various ways. And one of the things expected of us is uh, giving out our zakat al-Fitr before going for Eid. Being a day of celebration, uh, being a day of uh, happiness, it is expected that we all come together to support one, assault one another, in order to make sure no family is left with hunger. And part of the ways we get that solved is by making sure 
we give our zakat al-fitr. And zakat al-fitr is supposed to be given before one goes out for the Eid. The Messenger of Sallam said in a hadith that, you know, it is, uh, well, it is when one gives uh, zakat al-fitr before going for Eid, he said, فَهِيَا زَكَاتٌ مَقْبُولَ It is an acceptable, you know, zakat. وَمَنْ أَدَّهَا بَعْدَهَا Whoever gives after, Eid, after the Eid, فَهِيَا صَدَقَةٌ مِّنَ الصَّدَقَاتِ It is one of the charity among the, you know, the charities we usually do. So meaning, it is preferable, or it is meaning, uh, expected for one to give it out, you know, before going for Eid. And the essence of the zakat al-fadr, as we said, feeding the needy, because he said, طُهْرَةٌ لِلصَّائِمْ وَطُؤْمَةٌ لِلْمَسَاكِينَ It is serving as a means of cleansing for the one who fasted and also serving as a means of sustenance for, you know, the needy. May Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala make it easy for us to be able to, you know, keep to those uh, etiquette and may Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala accept our fasting and the other acts of nawafil we've been able to do in the month of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi وبركاته I'll be moving into Let's Cook right about now. This is Rabba Dabuta. He will be with you shortly. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Let's Cook on Ramadan Mutahir. I am Chef B and today I'll be preparing cinnamon smoothie. I'll be right back. Welcome back guys. So to make a cinnamon smoothie, you need cinnamon powder, full cream, ice cube, um, banana, For like about two three minutes to get a very smooth one this is going to be very yummy and nice wow so our cinnamon smoothie is ready so we need a cup right here. So I'm going to bring it out. So guys, let's solve.
on Instagram at Chevy Catering Services or Madame Karen. Welcome back from the break, and uh, that was Let's Cook. Mm. Alhamdulillah, like I said, if you follow us on our social media platform, you can get the chance to view all the dishes during this Ramadan and for you to recreate it as well. Without any further ado, let's jump on to Mr. Karim and uh, let's share the topic he has for us today. Yeah, uh, our today's topic has to do with selflessness. Um, the lesson that we we'll learn during the month, the holy month of Ramadan, even though we were not taught, or we were not conscious about it, that what are we doing? It was obviously that we were being selfless during Ramadan by sharing things that we have. When it is time to break the fast, mm. you see people bringing out the fruits by sharing it. Not that probably they want to, but because that month has actually conditioned them to do so. So meaning that Almighty Allah has actually used that month to teach us that you have to be selfless. When things are given to you, try to look for those who don't have, and share with them. Even those that have, extend it to them and let them reject by saying, that, oh, I already have. To show that you have a very good heart of reaching out. And you get of reaching out. So once that, has, once, that, once that has been done, it is a way to establish that Muslim, in al-Muslim, um, uh, al-Muslim, al -Muslim, Muslims, we are brothers, and we're supposed to extend the hand of oneness to one another. So, during the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I think in one of the battles, one of them was, one of the people that went to the war, severely injured, so was requesting for water from one of his brother. So when the brother, when the brother was about to give him the water, they saw another person who has a fatal injury. So he said, instead of giving me this water, so let's go and give it to him. So as they were about to give that one the water, they also saw another sahaba, with fatal injury. That's also, no, let's give it to the eternal at the end of the day. None of them who was able to drink the water by saying that it is you that's supposed to drink, it is you that's supposed to drink, it is you that's supposed to, to show the act of selflessness among them. But here we are. If it will, <laughs> happens to be us, so somebody will not even look at it <laughs> before you take the. So, what Islam has come to teach us is that because when you look at when our Almighty Allah, He created us to come and serve herself to come and serve one another mm. he created he created heaven he created um trees he created rivers all those things are meant to serve us look at the fishes in the water they are serving us look at um animals in the bush they are serving us because we go there we take them look at the trees the god almighty allah created them to serve us mm. why are we not going to serve even our, among ourselves so we as humans, when we wake up on a daily basis, we're supposed to look at, for instance, when you are not around, people should be able to say that ah, this thing is like this because this person is not Let me around. Help him clean it or are something. you getting that? So when we wake up in the morning, we're supposed to look at what we can we do, even if as small as removing something dangerous from the road. Are you getting that? That people will know that oh, if this person is around, this wouldn't have been like this. So that is how Muslims are supposed to be known. And that is the Typical act of selflessness. So when we wake up or when we want to do things or when we have anything in our, in our resource or in our pocket, we should look for how we can use those things to better the life of fellow humans. Because it is true that the Almighty Allah also are going to what? Is going to look into us and accept our ibadah. MashaAllah. Thank you so Bada much for that. Perfect, yeah. Well, that's the end of the discussion segment. Right about now, we'll be jumping into Sheikh Speaks. And as soon as we're back, it's word of the day. Stay tuned. This is Ramadan Mutahir. <laughs> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, first of all, taboo by definition is something that people tend to uh, leave behind uh, as a result of the sensitivity of that particular topic. So it's not only related to pornography. Pornography is one of those topics that are considered taboo in so many cultures. 
And when we say this, it's a taboo means don't talk about it. But the problem is prevalent. And it, I believe, I'm a big believer of addressing taboo matters because they spread uh, in silence, they spread in secret, and they became bigger and bigger. And, uh, and, and they, cre they create an unhealthy community. And that's what we wanted to avoid. So this one thing. Uh, why people don't want to talk about it because there is a shame associated with it. There is a guilt associated with it. No one actually is happy with uh, watching pornography. No one. See, if you're hungry and you pass by a picture of a Big Mac or Big Burger, you feel like you wanted to eat that poster, right? And so you look after an instant pleasure and that is fast food. Uh, if, you, if you have some headache or you are lacking a sleep or something, you look for instant coffee. And the moment you eat instant coffee or instant fast food, what happens after one hour? You get hungry again. Right? Because it's not filling. It's just a, a, a momentum, uh, 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 what do you call this? A, a, a quick pleasure that wouldn't last fast. And this is the same thing with pornography. You see a lot of varieties you enjoy for, an, for a minute or two or second or two and after a few days you go back again because they are not fulfilling. And so I believe that any taboo issue that is spreading evil, that's spreading damage in the community has to be addressed. People must learn uh, the, the, the consequences of indulging in this issue or else we will remain just, as I mentioned on the stage earlier, uh, zombie Muslims. In, Externally, we look like Muslims with hijab, with niqab, with, you know, the way how we dress, the way how we look. People know that we are Muslims. But internally, because of pornography, we are dead. I think we, we will be fooling ourselves to say that we can stop pornography from spreading. Pornography industry is multi-billion dollar industry. And as a result, it's uh, nearly impossible for us to ban pornography from everywhere. Uh, most likely it's impossible to stop the producers from uh, coming up uh, you know, that easy and, and quitting their job. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. So there are other industries and other departments are actually getting paid uh, to be supported, you know, to support this industry. It's just like the tobacco and the alcohol business. It's a business. They know the damage that it could cause, but they can't just simply ban it because it feeds them financially. But what we can do as government, as Islamic organizations, as parents, as students, is to raise a massive awareness about the dangerous harm of pornography. So that at least people would come, uh, would know the real harm of porn and they stop on their own. That's what we wanted to do. Instead of banning porn itself, we should raise the bar of uh, awareness uh, amongst every segment of the society. Muslims or non-Muslims, it doesn't matter. Islam is a religion that came to uh, spread peace and harmony to, to the society, not only to the Muslims, to everyone. So I have many clients who are non-Muslims, atheists, but I help them using these methods. Uh, so I, th I say education, training, awareness about the harmful impact of porn could reduce the damage. That's, that's my approach. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Wael Ibrahim, student counselor and author of the book Beat It 50 Plus Shades of Hope. And this is Ummah TV. Welcome back, that was Sheikh Speaks, and Alhamdulillah, we've come to the word of the day. Today, we're taking a look at death. A lot of times, people hear death. Some run, some say, I don't fear death. In fact, we've heard the famous lines, even in movies, that I'll see you in hell, confidently, you know, it's just tossed around so half-heartedly, without understanding the importance or what death actually means. Now, to you as a Muslim, what does death mean to you? This is a question that you should take home and actually ask yourself as well. Have you done good enough to find death? Have you done bad enough 
to reject death, to correct yourself before that time. And I think one of the beauties and the regrets of life is that you don't know when you're going to pass away. Allah watches you and knows exactly every step you're taking and then he takes you away at the most sudden point. In fact, it's even looked at to an extent that how you die is actually an image of how you've lived your life. If you die horribly, it's because of the things you've been doing. And if you die maybe in your sleep or while praying, it's because of what you've also been doing. There's a positive and negative type of difference when we come to the, when we come to see how people have died as well. Alhamdulillah, we've come to the end of the word of the day today. And we shall be moving into instructional Quran right about now. So do stay tuned. This is Ramadan Mutahir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to these wonderful segment of Instructional Quran on, um, on Ramadan Matahir on Ummah TV. I'm your host, Ustaz Jamal Chief. Instructional Quran is a show designed to bring about you know, the best of the Quran, the best instructions from the Quran that Allah wants us to use to improve our lives, to be better humans, to be better Muslims, in a certainly, and to be better uh, believers, in a certainly. We're going to go to the um, uh, the next one, which Allah says, protect and help those who seek protection. Allah says, in وَإِنْ أَحْدُ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأْجِرُهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعْ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِهُ مَأْمَنَهُ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And Allah says, and if any of those who associate others with Allah in His divinity seek asylum from you, seek asylum, grant him asylum that he may hear the word of Allah and then escort him to safety for they are a people who do not really know. So what Allah is saying here is, for instance, in a Muslim community, you know, they, they are at, um, maybe at war with another a, uh, an unbelieving nation or a non-Muslim community, for instance, and one of the people from the non-Muslim community come to the Muslim for asylum, Allah is saying the Muslims have to keep him safe and protect him. You do not say, oh, because he's, not, he's a non-Muslim, Allah is saying you must keep him safe and protect him. He said, Allah says, if he seeks asylum, we grant him asylum. You have to grant them asylum. You, get, you don't say it because it's a non-Muslim. So this, this clearly shows the, the rights of non-Muslim in an Islamic space. Most of the time, people, under, people think that, you know, uh, when it comes to Islam, Muslims are compelled to follow Islamic rulings. No. In an Islamic country, a non-Muslim is, is not compelled. Matter of fact, it must, he, if he doesn't want to follow Islamic ruling, he has a right not to follow Islamic ruling. The Charter of Medina that was signed by the Prophet Muhammad and the, and the tribes of Medina was called the first democratically you know, inclined charter in the entire world. It was a charter that Mo Prophet Muhammad signed that says that anyone has a right to practice their religion without fear or favor. They have a right without recrimination to practice their faith. And if they go against any ruling, they have to be judged by their own book. So a non-Muslim in an Islamic country will be judged by the dictates of his religious book. He will not be judged by the dictates of Islamic Sharia or Islamic law. Because Allah says, La ikra hafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. You cannot compel people to follow your religion. You cannot, it's un-Islamic. And the reason largely is because when you compel someone to follow your religion, they are not doing it sincerely. And Allah will not accept what is done insincerely. If, someone, if you're forcing someone to pray, for instance, they're not doing it for the sake of Allah, and so Allah will not accept their prayer. So whatever it is we're doing in Islamic space has to be from our hearts, and you can only allow people get there by themselves. Islam says you cannot compel people to worship your own God. You cannot. It is un-Islamic. So, وَمَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ Yours is just to convey the message to them and say, this is what Islam says, this is what Islam says, and leave it at that. You have no right to compel non-Muslims to be Muslims. And that connects with when Allah says that if any of them has come to you seeking asylum, then do not turn him out. See, if someone is coming to seek asylum from you, a non-Muslim is coming to seek asylum and say, protect me, is your right as a Muslim to protect him so that maybe when he stays among the Muslims, he might hear the word of God and have a change of heart. So Islam is against compulsion. You have no right to compel people. Allah told the Prophet, Umar alayka illa al al mubin Yours is just to convey the message and pray that Allah guides them. Because the moment you compel them to be Muslims, then everything they're doing is based on fear. The Prophet says, it's an ad-deen and nasiha. This religion of ours is a religion of sincerity. You have to be sincere to Allah. So Allah is saying, if a non-Muslim comes to you seeking asylum, it is your right to protect him so that he may at least hear the word of Allah. You get the, and you have to, so not only would you protect him, also convey him to a safe place from a war zone. 
They say, Hata yasma kalam al thumma ablihu ma mana. Then may you know convey him. Then then hear the word of, and then escort him to safety. Escort him to safety. For there are people who do not know Allah is saying because some of them they don't even know about Islam. That's why they are against Islam. It's not because they have hatred against you because they do not know. They they ignorant. You get so it's important for us to educate. So understand the takeaway here is there is no compulsion in religion. Allah does not force us to compel anyone to be Muslim. It is our duty to educate, and that's all we can do. We have to understand that what Islam says, Iqra like, Fiddin, there's no compulsion. If a non-Muslim comes to me to you seeking protection, it is your duty as a Muslim to protect him and also to deliver him, escort him to safety. Don't say, oh, he's not from my religion. Allah does not want that from us. So that's how far we're going to be going on today's um, segment, Instruction of Quran. I am your host, Ustaz Jamal Sheath. See you some other time. Ma'as Salam. <laughs>